Good morning and you're very welcome to this morning's live with me uh, answering all of your home design, interiors, architecture, any kind of questions to do with your home and thank you so much to everybody who has messaged me about these lives saying how much they've been helping um you know some some people calling them their lockdown treat like it's it's great it's just wonderful to get that kind of feedback and to hear that they have been so helpful for people so i'm absolutely delighted by that and thanks also to everybody who sent in their questions uh some fantastic questions so i've tried to group them into the different topics and i'll run through them um and what i'm going to start with this morning is costs so I know there's been a lot of confusion about costs over the last while, ever since March. Um, we did a couple of great lives with Patricia Power and I would encourage people to go back and watch those because they're so informative. Uh, Patricia is so clear in how she explains everything and um, it's just an absolutely uh, brilliant way for you to, you know, um, uh, just figure out what the costs need to be. So uh, this morning, what uh, the first question that we got about cost was somebody saying that they're buying a rundown 1980s bungalow. Um, it's about 75 square meters. It has a terrible layout. It's in dire need of extension and renovation. And they're just trying to get a gauge on the cost and what they should do. So they're sort of, you know, throwing out a couple of ideas, uh, whether it's a rear extension for 40 square meters adding a second story with uh, which most of the neighboring houses have done or a second story with a smaller rear extension. So they're just trying to get a gauge on what the costs are. And I suppose if, uh, you know, as I say, go back and watch the two lives with Patricia, I think you'll find them really, really helpful. But the one thing I would say about doing work to any house, every house is completely different, um, even on the, strain, the same street. And I suppose every house has to be looked at independently. The costs are going to depend on the kind of work you're doing, you know, the kind of design, say, for example, your floor to ceiling height. You know, if you want to do something amazing at the back with glazing, all of these things are going to have a bearing on your cost, the kind of structure that's required. So, you know, each renovation is completely different. But I suppose if you want to take a gauge most of the work that, that you're talking about doing is what would be classed as new build. So they're, they're all extension projects, basically. So to budget for extension, what I would advise is that you allow yourself about 2,000 to 2,500 per square meter. So, you know, for a 40 square meter extension, then you're looking at about 80,000. But what you have to bear in mind and what a lot of people forget about then is the renovation works to the existing house just to bring that up to standard. And, and if this bungalow is in terrible condition, you know, you're going to need to insulate it, rewire it, replumb it. So there's a huge amount of work to bring that up to scratch, never mind decoration and all the fixtures and fittings that you're going to need as well. So it's just to factor all of that in. And we also have a free resource. It's a budgeting guide. Um, so you can download that. I'll put the link in our bio uh, straight after this. But that's really helpful in terms of telling you how much of your budget you need to allocate to each of the different areas. So, for example, your construction costs will be about 40 percent of your budget, your fixtures and fittings, which are things like your kitchen, your floors, your sanitary ware, all those fixed items that you need. That's about 30 percent of your budget. So that's going to be on top of this construction cost. So it's just to factor all of these things in. Really important to sit down, try and work it out. Do ask for advice. Um, plenty of people who can give you advice. You know, our design pack is a great way to get a sense of what the work is going to cost. It'll show you what's possible, um, you know, within your brief and your budget. So lots of ways that you can get uh, some really good advice without spending an awful lot up front. Um, so again, I'll put the, the link for our budgeting guide in the bio after this and then do go and check out the, the two uh, lives with Patricia Power. I think you'll find them really, really helpful. Um, so then just an awful lot of questions about colour, which um, we always get so many, so many questions about colour. And, you know, I could talk about colour all day long. And actually next weekend, 
Um, Kate from the Paint Hub in Carlo is going to be joining me again. So if you have painting tips and especially any kind of tips that you want for tackling a DIY project, I mean, Kate has just got such a wealth of knowledge. Uh, she's just the most amazing uh, individual and she's just brilliant when it comes to that. So do save those up and tune in next week. But uh, one of the questions we got this morning was that the traditional home with windows um, in the front, which are white, and they're thinking of doing the back windows in a RAL 7016. So that's um, anthracite gray, which is very popular with a lot of the window companies. Personally, I'd suggest going a little bit darker. So the thing about the grays is they can look very different in different lights. And, you know, gray, possibly something that over time isn't, isn't you know, may date, I guess. So what I'd be advising, because it is lovely to do something completely different, especially if you're doing work at the back, so that you have that transition from the existing house into the new work that you've done at the back. So by differentiating that, by using different colors in the windows and stuff is a great idea. But instead of the anthracite gray, I'd go with something that's slightly darker. It's, it's actually an off black. It's a lovely soft color. Um, and I just think it's a timeless color. It's, it almost disappears at nighttime. It, and it also during the day, you know, it doesn't distract from the, the lovely view if you've got a lot of glazing bars. So the RAL color is 7021. And again, I'll pop this um, in the information with the live when hopefully I can save it this week uh, because last week it was giving me trouble. So I'll do my best to put all of this information. But 7021, that's, that's what I'd recommend instead of the anthracite gray. Um, then somebody else saying, doing up a house at the moment, wanted to ask advice about neutral shades for a hall and living room. So there's some fabulous colors. And I think the nice thing about a hallway is you can go a little bit darker. You know, these are transition spaces that you just move through. So you don't have to worry about, you know, trying to make them bright or doing anything in particular. But there is a lovely color um, called pure muslin that I would use a lot. Um, I actually have it in my own living room. It's a really soft, warm, neutral. And I might just see, I have a photo here. Um, see if I can show you oh shoot for some reason it hasn't saved but again I'll pop it up in stories afterwards but it's a lovely kind of sandy warm shade and I'd actually use it in both spaces because in your hallway it's going to look an awful lot darker and then the living room it'll just take on a whole new light but it'll it'll do a, a really lovely thing where it'll unify the space and that, that movement through the two rooms. So that's one I'd really recommend. Um, then looking for an off-white for an open plan kitchen, living, dining area. It's north facing. I'll pop color through soft furnishings. Kitchen cabinets are white with copper running through it. So thinking of soft furnishings in burnt orange and teal. So that's a gorgeous combination. I think the use of copper is really beautiful. If it's north facing and then you have got those copper tones, which are quite warm, I'd suggest something really soft. So a little bit like what I have on the wall here behind me, which is subtle cinder. Um, and I'll just pop this up so you can see it. So that's it there. So you can see this, it's a very subtle difference between the white, but it is, I suppose it will just help to cool everything cool everything down a little bit. Even though it's north facing, it's still going to give you lots of brightness. There is an underlying warmth to it, but it'll just neutralize um, those copper tones. And they're gorgeous colors to, um, to bring in and mix in. And I think the teals, you know, with coppers work really well. Greens work really well. Uh, you can see this color palette here. Or also, you know, soft blues and things like that are absolutely beautiful with those copper tones and whites. So subtle cinder is what I would recommend for that one. Um, and then we got a lovely question actually about flow and layout. So somebody asking, um, you know, is it important to create flow from one room to another? And if so, how do you recommend doing this? So there's lots of ways you can do this. And I suppose it depends on the the amount of work that you want to do with the house but one of the easiest ways is to kind of unify your base so that happens with your floor finish so if you've got um take bedrooms for example running the same carpet through into all of the bedrooms is a brilliant way just to kind of unify that and create flow through the spaces or down on the ground floor maybe limit your choice of flooring to to two or even one 
um, and that will really help to unify. It's especially good if you live in a small space, you know, apartments, things like that. Just running the one floor finish right throughout just really gives a sense of space and unifies everything throughout the house. And then the next step to create flow would be to, to select um, complementary color palettes. So, you know, you don't have to go for the same color in every single room, but do try and pick colors that are gonna complement each other. So maybe they have the same base tone. Um, if you pick up something like a, a signature color card, you'll see that they're all grouped into trios. So you can either pick different ones from that three or you'll see as well, they're laid out side by side to colors that really work well with them. So it'll sort of help you build that color palette and pull everything through. And then finally, I'd say try and keep your style um, consistent. So what you don't want is a room full of, you know, very old furniture or antique style and then going into another room, which is very contemporary. Um, it's actually nicer just to mix through the, the contemporary and the antique throughout the house so that you're not feeling that kind of uh, disjointed feeling as you're moving through the house. So think about your style and then by having, um, you know, some kind of unity and flow throughout the house, what it means is that you'll find it's really easy to interchange pieces of furniture, accessories, things like that. So you'll easily be able to refresh your room or give a space a whole new lease of life very inexpensively and very easily by doing something like that. Um, then we got a question, lots of questions about flooring actually. So um, there's a great live, if you check it out, that I did with Jacqueline Walsh from Tile Style, all about timber floors. Really worth uh, looking at that. And there's some amazing products available um, on the market, you know, inexpensive ways even to do things like chevron herringbone floors, which are so popular at the moment. So do go back and watch that if you have time. Um, but one person asking dark wooden floors versus light wooden floors in medium sized rooms. I love dark, but I'm seeing a lot of light in imagery. So uh, honestly, this comes down to personal preference. Either can work really, really well. Um, you know, I suppose you're seeing a lot of light at the moment because it's very on trend. You know, that sort of natural paired back look is really, really in at the moment. But there's lots and lots of beautiful dark floors um, available as well. And lots of oak floors which have been stained or smoked to give them a rich depth um, and darker tone. And you know, oak is just such a fantastic flooring because it's so durable. So really worth seeking that out. But I'd, I'd say, you know, if you're going with dark, um, then you can kind of, that will ground the floor. You know, it'll really sort of anchor the room for you. And then you can build on that. Maybe you want to keep your walls slightly lighter. Um, but I would suggest that any, type of timber color, whatever color you go for, try and pick that up then in the other furniture items in the room, just so that you don't have too many clashing timbers going on. Um, and then we have another question, which is what would you choose for a classic wooden floor? Want it to be a wild floor, but don't want it to date. So I, I think what I would suggest for this is something like this one here, which is a beautiful chevron floor. Um, so this is actually from the Hardwood Floor Company um, and it's absolutely beautiful. This is just such a timeless look. Um, it's a lovely neutral colour so you can see it's slightly, uh, it's like an oiled, slightly grey oiled um, oak floor and it's just timeless. It's going to work with so many different colour palettes but it does really make an impact. It really has that wow factor without it being too trendy or something that you'd have to worry about replacing in a few years. Um, and then we got a flooring, a flooring question, which I probably get asked at least once a month, what is the best floor for kitchens? So honestly, my own personal preference is tiles. Uh, the reason for that is that you just don't have to worry about them in terms of maintenance. You know, kitchens are places they're busy, there's a lot of water, there's a lot of appliances. Um, so something like timber, which a lot of people absolutely love the idea of, is going to need a lot of minding. And timber just doesn't like water. That's, that's just the reality. So, you know, areas around your sink, for example, you're gonna see wear and tear. Um, for other people, they don't really mind that. So they're, you know, they're used to that. Uh, that's absolutely fine. But honestly, my own personal preference would be to go for something like a porcelain tile. Um, you can get fabulous large format tiles now, which means your grout joints are sort of minimal, which makes the floor really easy to keep. 
porcelain's a brilliant partner for underfloor heating. So if that's something that you have, porcelain floor tiles, which is gorgeous underfoot, so you don't have to worry about the cold feeling, which is what would have put people off um, in the past. But then if your heart is set on timber, something like a hard wax oil finish is going to just give that little bit of water resistance and durability that you need. But again, I'd encourage you, if you are thinking of either tiles or timber, go back and watch some of the lives that we've done specifically on those topics. Um, you'll find loads and loads of advice for that. Um, and then we got another uh, great question about light, you know, darker spaces, north facing rooms, east facing rooms. So one about the best way to get light into a north facing entrance area. So I think with, you know, with hallways, uh, the best thing to do is, first of all, if you can try and um, put glazed internal doors into any of the rooms coming off of the hallway, if it is particularly dark. Uh, so like the classic thing, if you happen to have a, a door at the end of the hallway, just turning that into a glazed door is a fantastic way to, to let light in. But it also will allow your, um, you know, the view to be on on view as soon as you step inside the front door, which is so lovely. And often that's straight out onto the garden, which is, is really nice. Uh, another thing that works really well is if you can introduce some sort of glazing into your front door, if you are thinking about replacing your front door. Um, even if it is frosted, you know, or has privacy glass in it, that is going to let some light in, which will make a big difference. And then things like adding mirrors in, you know, we've done this a lot in, a, in apartments where uh, if perhaps you're looking straight at a wall when you walk in, you can have a wall of mirror there or a wall of mirror to the side, anywhere that's going to reflect light from somewhere else. Uh, it's a very inexpensive thing to do. You can get the mirrors cut to any size and it just really, really works at making the space feel bigger and brighter. And then just think about lighting. You know, if you can introduce lamps, things like that, artificial lighting, um, that's all going to help as well. And then somebody asking about a northeast facing open plan. Um, would it be too dark a space? So I think, look, if, if that's the orientation of your home and that's where the open plan space has to be, that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, the lovely thing about north facing is uh, for a lot of people, the south facing open plan spaces can actually be super bright. So things like roof lights, you have to be really careful about where you're putting them. But with a north facing space, the use of roof lights can really uh, help with letting light in. What I would be mindful of is looking at that space um, where if you're extending, where the existing house meets the new extension. So that's going to become the middle of your house and that's where it's going to be darkest. So if you can think about maybe putting utility spaces there, maybe it's cloak rooms, guest WC, storage space in that really dark space, that works really well. Or if you need that for living space, try and put your roof light as close to that space as you possibly can to throw light back into it. And that'll make a massive difference. So yeah, think about your placing of roof lights and then think about utility spaces and just working with those, those darker areas. They're the ideal location to put those in. Um, question then we got about heating for bathrooms and a uh, question about Devi mats. So again, we've covered this with Tile Style when we went and chatted about bathrooms with them. So you could go back and have a look at that. Devi mats are great. You know, they are electric heating mats that sit underneath your tiles and they operate independently from the main heating system. They're a brilliant way to just take the chill out of the tiles in a bathroom. Um, they're not, they're not a, a cost effective way to heat a room. So I wouldn't be recommending them to heat the room. They're usually used in conjunction with something like a towel radiator or a, a second radiator, but they are a great idea. And actually, you know, we would have worked with clients in the past who might have taken those out because of budget and they do regret doing that. Um, and they're, they're super easy to use. They'll have a little control panel that sits outside the bathroom and you can set it then, put it on a timer just to come on maybe in the morning or in the evening when you're going to be in there but I would advise it, um, very easy to install and definitely, definitely worthwhile. Um, so then I'm just going to go back because I saw a few questions coming in here. So I want to make sure that I get to cover as many as I can. Um, so let me just see here. 
So yeah, this is interesting. So any way to stop pale oak floor yellowing in strong sunlight? Uh, my wonderful pale herringbone is turning yellow. Yeah, this is a trouble. It's it's a problem, you know, with staining. And I think we had a good chat with this uh, about this topic. Sorry, with Kate when she was on. So you can go back and have a look at that. Um, it might be worth reaching out to them. I know there was a product um years ago that I used myself. I mean, really years ago, uh, from a company called Bonakimi. Uh, you can look it up, and it comes in. It's it's almost like um like a milky product that you you paint onto the floorboards and it has that UV protection that stops them from yellowing. So really it comes down to the finishing of the floor. So possibly um, it's, it's worth checking with whoever supplied the floor, but possibly it's something, you know, if they are going yellow, uh, whatever is on them, perhaps it's a varnish or a lacquer, uh, probably would need to be sanded back and then refinish with something that has a UV protection in it. Um, and th that is an issue. It is literally just the, the sunlight is, is causing it to yellow. You'll see it happen in, in pieces of furniture as well. But it's a really good um, question and it's something actually I'm going to send on to Kate and just see if she can next week come up with some products um, and we can put the links then to that. So hopefully we'll be able to find something for you for that. Um, okay, and then... Another question here. So we're renovating an old house from a D2 to an A1 and adding a 50 square meter extension. It's coming in over 300K. So that sounds fantastic, um, but not happy about that. Yeah, like it, it is really, really, um, the costs are, you know, as I say, it is between 2,000 and 2,500 per square meter for new build and then the renovation like certainly to bring a house up to an A1 standard there's a lot of work involved in that to do with insulating um, and so many other things so it is costly and I suppose that is the thing that catches people out is that renovation cost uh, because the extension is is easy to price in that it's a standard, you know, depending on the, the type of finish you want to go for, you, you can easily figure out a, a rate per square meter. But because every house is completely different in terms of the condition, you know, take period houses versus newer houses. So the work that has to be done will vary so dramatically that those renovation costs are really hard to estimate um, going into the project. So that's why it's so important to get a really good set of drawings done to give to your builders so that they can price accurately and work out those costs for you. Um, but again, anybody, as I say, looking for information on costs to go back and watch the two videos with Patricia, you'll find them really, really helpful. And do reach out to us as well. You know, if you want to book a call and have a chat about anything, our lines are open Monday to Saturday. Um, so do, do get in touch if there's anything that you want to talk about. Okay, let me make sure I haven't missed anybody. Yeah, well, I think that's everything, everybody. Um, thank you so much for all your questions. Do continue to, to send them in. We'll do our best throughout the day to try and answer. And I'll put as much information, um, I'll share some stuff on stories and I'll put it into the, the text with the post as well. But thank you so much. I hope you found it helpful. Do go back and watch some of the older videos. And there's so much stuff in the blog and lots of ebooks as well in the resource section. So have a look around. Like we do have a, a whole post on that topic of creating flow at home. Um, lots and lots of information on color if you're looking for color. And then most of the other topics that people were bringing up today are covered in the, the live. So do go back and, and have a look at those. So have a lovely weekend, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. And myself and Kate will see you next week. Bye bye.